Spirits in the Material World is my title, and I I will be very practical in terms that, well, let me start by a very essential and crucial assumption. Uh, this is something I tell my students each year in my courses, um, a definition of what an archaeologist is. Uh, in my perception, archaeologists are nothing but historians. Uh, we are historians, uh, and our main focus is the material evidence. So that's what makes us different from the, you know, true historians, those who are much more uh, in contact with written or iconographic evidence. We deal with materialities, and this Congress is about, this conference is about immaterialities. And I am going to tackle this issue by pointing out, firstly, a weakness of archaeology. I mean, it has been mentioned, but I will go deep into it. Archaeology has somehow a, what we call in Italian a statuto debole, a weakness, a weak status. Uh, the weak status is due to the fact that, first of all, excavating means destructing. Excavation is destruction. And secondly, and in my uh, view most important, uh, being there during the excavation is the main thing. You say things other people want just because you destroy these things as soon as you discover them. And thus, communication is a crucial passage of the archaeological work. Therefore, I will focus my attention on archaeological reconstructions. Archaeological reconstructions are quite important, are one of the main means through which archaeologists do communicate their work, what they understood, what they think, and their interpretations. So my paper will be articulated in three sections. The first one is about people. People can enter the archaeological reconstructions, and there are different kinds of approach. One of them is just like here, we have a masterpiece of one of the main uh, main artists, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, concerning archaeological reconstruction. Sheila Gibson worked for the British School at Rome for decades. She really gave us uh, an important example of how archaeological reconstructions can be. And in this case, and in all the corpus of uh, Sheila's work, people are nothing but sort of ghosts, really ghosts in the machine. They are, you know, they have no faces, they're just silhouettes. Uh, and their main uh, role in these reconstructions is twofold. On the one hand, they're useful. They're useful to, you know, animate the scene, and on the other hand, they're useful because they give you the scale of the scene. So the main thing here is architecture and landscape. So this is one of the possible approaches to people in archaeological reconstructions. Um, and this is where I want to go, people. People are obviously our main goal. We don't want to just you know, deal with pottery architecture, marbles. We want to know the people that were behind them. We want to know the people that used them, that built them. And if you choose people, uh, especially if you go in, you know, places like, I mean, time places like prehistory, um, then you will adventure yourself in the realm of conjecture more and more since there's no written evidence so this is this couple of pictures i show now uh, they are just meant to convey you one of the things that's been debated 
most recently about the cultural bias that can come uh, when we, you know, approach uh, prehistory in terms of gender. Um, there was a very important congress in the 60s that was entitled Men the Hunter. That was a turning point because the old feminist part of uh, prehistorians, uh, you know, rebelled against it. There was a sort of a scientific riot. Uh, in all these reconstructions, a man was always hunting and women were just, you know, uh, going after the children and cooking, taking care of the cave. Um, and right now we know this was not true. Uh, we know that uh, women hunted as well, and women could also be uh, painters, and that some of the masterworks that, you know, arrive to us from prehistory are possibly uh, due to the men of women. So, so one of the problems with our archaeological communication and reconstructions is also that it can be gender biased. But I want to go deeper into this, into the issue of people uh, and say that it's not just a matter of stereotypes, it's also a matter of what kind of meaning you want to convey to the wider public. So I'll show you this, this illustration. This reconstruction was drawn by Peter Connolly, who was an artist and was an academic as well. This is an Iron Age British couple. And of course, the core of the drawing is meant to convey information about the house that is behind, so building techniques, shape of the house, and the dresses, uh, and the weapons. But as has been brilliantly written, the glance between the couple gives us more of a story than just a description of their appearance. So what I'm trying to say is um, archeological reconstructions can really go deep into uh, emotions. Uh, archeologists can start adventuring themselves even through simple media as this ones into a dimension of the past that it's usually neglected, which is an archaeology of emotions, which is of course conjectural, but why not? Why not? Uh, there's a huge gap in using people silhouettes this way and in trying to go deep into feelings uh, like in this case. My second issue is about what I call archaeological situations, which is actually, I'm quoting the title of a recent wonderful book by Gavin Lucas. <clears throat> um, I mean for that, well, you see what I mean for that. Uh, I'll go through some examples. Uh, 1653, we have the discovery of Kilderix, the king of the Franks, Kilderix's grave at Tournay in Belgium. Uh, this is a crucial date. I consider this the birth, the, the birth certificate of medieval archaeology in Europe. Um, to make a long story short, uh, it was uh, it was a chance. I mean, people were restoring. Is this working? Uh, uh, people were restoring a building which was close to the church of uh, uh, San Fermin, and actually they found a treasure, what they call a treasure, actually it was grave goods. So they, there was no archeologist there. I mean, archeology span was not alive at the moment. There was just antiquarians. So they destroyed the whole context and there was a seal ring with the name of Kilderic. That's why uh, the, character is supposed to be Kilderic I, who died at the end of the 5th century. And the court physicians, uh, physician, uh, the name is Jean-Jacques Chiflet, came and he wrote a book 
with a thick description of all the great goods, but actually this is all we had. This is what we had until the 80s, 1980s, when my friend and colleague Raymond Brulé went and excavated again the site because he was not satisfied with the evidence. And he found out very interesting things, and I will be very short on this. He understood that the grave of Kildrick was inserted into a cemetery that was already there, uh, and that most possibly, I mean, th there were graves with horses all around it, and that most possibly Kildrick's grave was under a mound, a tumulus. These are the new things that Raymond Brulé uh, excavated. But then this leaves aside a whole world uh, and sort of compresses a whole temporality issue, which is behind this uh, funerary event, I would call it. Uh, there are diverse episodes and moments that were not recorded actually in archaeological context. And this is one of my major points. We miss many things. We miss many things as, as we enter the grave of Kildrick, as we enter the grave of Tutankhamun, time is compressed. Something very complex happened. Something very complex took place between the death of Kildrick uh, and you, you will see other people's that before they were interred and sealed by the mound. Uh, and recently, a cartoon uh, showed all of this because we miss the moments of, you know, the exposition of the body. We miss the moment of the funeral. And these are just a few images that I took from the cartoon. And this is, this. I, I think you could know this series. It's it's an important series because it is, yeah, it's it's comic books, but the, the title of the series is Ils sont fait l'histoire, they made history. And each volume is supervised by an historian. In this case, the man is Bruno Dumézil. There's one about Ramses II, which I want to give you as a present. Um, so, the funeral, the uh, deposition of the grave goods you see here, and the and we have to imagine a whole ceremony with people chanting, uh, people declaring the importance of grave goods again. The the oral words, uh, no possibility to write things, but things that are declared in front of the mass of people who couldn't read. Uh, and it's also a cruent ceremony in which uh, more than 20 horses were slaughtered, including uh, Kildrick's one. So at the end, there's the tumulus that seals this all, and the same things happens with uh, the Osberg ship in Norway. And again, this reconstruction by Handes Kvaler Ruhr gives me the possibility to uh, spend a little more words about the fact that we actually don't know how much this graves, be that a funerary chamber or a boat, were exposed. How long people could go and visit, and are all the grave goods, you know, things that were owned by the man that's buried there, or some of them are gifts, maybe, you know, brought by ambassadors that came from abroad. I'm, I'm also talking of something very well known like uh, Saturn Who Ship Burial, which is possibly, has, has been possibly left, you know, visible for months before it was completely sealed. And here you see half the mound, which gives people the idea of how everything will end, but then they can still see the boat. So, um, so these are ways in which we can convey information of all the 
aspects of the funerary rituals that we don't see because we uh, face just, you know, the grave. And uh, am I so silly that I am proposing you that the solution is cartoons? No, I, I don't think I am that silly. Uh, and I think that archaeologists are already somehow dealing. There are a few examples in my knowledge of people trying to do these sort of things, trying to uh, use uh, this kind of communication reconstructions. And this is this is Aaron Watson. He's an artist, and he made this sort of reenactment. It's black and white pictures that give us the idea of the past, so to say. But these are all the moments that an archaeologist usually doesn't see. Um, so this was my second point. And the third and final point is related to buildings and structures, which remain one of our main mm -hmm. uh, goals uh, in archaeology. And I will go uh, by using an example from a territory in which I'm excavating right now, which is Cervia. This is the church of San Martino Propelitus Maris, a sixth century um, a sixth century church close to Ravenna. Um, now I want to switch my point from just communication through uh, archaeological documentation on site and in laboratory and how can we turn this into a reconstruction? Because here there's a methodological point which I think is very important. Okay, this is what well, in black you see the structures that have actually been found. And as you can see, it's not so many. It's just this part, this bit of the walls. As you see, this porch is just two pillars of the porch. So let us say that at least 80, 85% of this reconstruction is conjectural, okay? And this is again here, and on the right side, you have the image that now has entered all the scientific publications about this, which is quite assertive. Everything is black. And now that turns into reality. Everything is black. And starting from this one, we made, me and myself, uh, George Albertini, who's a wonderful draftsman, we made this reconstruction. And again, everything is assertive. Everything is, you know, this is conceived for a wider public and everything is in color. But is this correct? I just said that 85% of this is conjectural. So this is a matter of intellectual honesty. Or to be more precise, I can choose this image for a museum because it conveys the, you know, the overall picture. And it's quite understandable for a wider public. But on the other hand, I wish to be a more honest archaeologist. I wish to be a philologist in this case. And then the solution and this is the solution I adopted, and I'm quite open to accept other points of view, is this one. We just used the color for the small parts that were actually discovered. And the rest of it is a ghost, is black and white, which means this is conjectural. This is more honest, okay? Um, I will go to the last slides. Uh, there's also, it's not just a matter of intellectual honesty, it's also a matter of the nature of archaeological evidence. Some of the archaeological evidence, even, even that relating to ancient Egypt, can be very flimsy. Wood, uh, plants, and stuff like that. Organic remains. Uh, in face plants, we all know face plants. With face plants, we are still in the realm of data. It's not conjectural. Uh, we start from face plant and then on face plants, we try and sketch our reconstruction. So in this slide, you have an example of face plant with flimsy evidence. 
a castle in Wales excavated in a majestic way by Master Philip Barker, and it's just post holes. It's pits, pits in the ground. All this black thing you see are post holes. And this is the reconstruction. This is how he interpreted the structures starting from the post holes. Of course, there's a matter of comparison with other structures we know, with iconographies and stuff, but flimsy evidence can be really hard to interpret and there are many options sometimes. So this is a quite known example from Cowdery's Down in England, same set of postals, and you can interpret it as a simple house in the example below, or, you know, the Herod Royal Palace of Beowulf, you know, a palace for a king. Uh, same evidence, two different ways of dealing with it. So every reconstruction must start from, must take the start from evidence and every reconstruction must be honest, intellectually honest related to it. Uh, because there are many things we miss, but we have ways to find out. And sometimes it can be really frustrating and try and understand a very simple evidence like this, for instance. Uh, three postals, it depends on where you find them. Because if you happen yourself to be just a few miles away of Jerusalem on a hill, this is what the postals would mean. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>